Bonjour à tous. Bonjour à tous. If, good evening. Welcome. If you're looking for the Federation of Alliance Française talk on the Père Lachaise, congratulations, you're in the right place. Um, maybe give people another minute to sign on here. Thank you very much for being here tonight or today, depending where you're signing in from. And um, I think we can. Uh, I think we can go ahead. So, uh, so good evening, bonjour à tous. Uh, my name is Charles Coulon. I'm the vice president of the Alliance Française de DuPage, about 25 miles west of Chicago. I'm also a member of the Federation Board, the Federation of Alliance Française Board. I serve on the cultural committees, amongst others. And it's my pleasure to host this session here for you tonight. Um, just announcing a few more cultural programs coming up in the next few weeks, including an interview with author Tatiana de Rosne on a, um, with a conversation with journalist Joe Myers. And then uh, there is a guy you may already know who's going to be talking about the Metro, encore. Uh, so, you know, en français this time. So you can go to AFUSA.org for more information about those programs. Few basic uh, housekeeping rules here. More importantly, note that we're recording uh, this uh, this session. It will be posted on the Federation's YouTube channel uh, in a few days, and you are on mute during this presentation. So please feel free to enter uh, your your questions, your comments along the way. I will centralize them and uh, ask them to Carolyn uh, after her slideshow of pictures because. Here we have um, Carolyn Campbell, who is a photographer, uh, and I, it's my pleasure to introduce you uh, to her to you all here tonight. Uh, she's a native of Washington, D.C., and uh, she's studied at the Maryland Institute College of Art. She's worked at the Corcoran Gallery of Art, uh, the American Film Institute, and also UCLA, which is close to where she now lives in the Los Angeles area. She became a great uh, Francophile and Père Lachaise expert, and I will let her explain why and how as she basically takes us on a slideshow photo tour of the Père Lachaise. Um, and uh, before we get started, I do want, and we'll plug that a little bit later as well in the program, but she does have the, her book, of course, City of Immortals, which is right here. Uh, and you can get it with a 20% discount code from her uh, from her publisher editor, and that is valid through the month of May. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with the um, picture with the with the slideshow. And um, Carolyn, the floor is all yours. Bienvenue. Thank you, and thank you everyone for being here this afternoon, this evening. My deepest appreciation to Charles. Um, Vice President of Alliance Francaise DuPage and board member of the Federation Alliance Francaise. It's my pleasure to be here and a shout out to all my um, native Washingtonians and Maryland and Virginia folks. Welcome, welcome. For me personally, no cemetery is more rewarding or historically significant than Père Lachaise, which is located in the far eastern section of Paris. It's really one of the most idyllic I've ever visited. It's a forest, really, with 5,000 trees, maple, oak, ash, birch, chestnuts. It is a festival of color in the fall, um, filled with the sounds of songbirds in the trees overhead. In springtime, the sweet smell of chestnut blossoms um, fills the air, and it's really quite indescribable. The cemetery is also the largest green space in the city. Though it is a modern garden style cemetery, its layout is very urban, 170 acre cityscape with winding streets, pathways, and directional signage. It became, um, it became a model for cemeteries as a place to stroll, a fusion of nature, sculpture, and memory. That brings to mind a favorite quote of mine by Honoré de Balzac, who was buried there. I seldom go out, but when I feel myself flagging, I go out and cheer myself up in Père Lachaise. While seeking out the dead, I see nothing but the living. 
Before we go on a brief tour of the cemetery, I wanted to go back and research how I became a passionate Francophile. Um, as Charles has mentioned, um, my hometown is Washington, D.C., and I have that city and the beloved Corcoran Gallery of Art to thank. I grew up flying my kite under the 500 foot tall marble obelisk in the Washington Monument and ran alongside the football field length of the reflecting pool. I didn't know until high school that the city was planned by a Frenchman, Pierre Charles L'Enfant. He was responsible for the elegant design of the National Mall with its wide boulevards for strolling and gardens bordered on one end by the Potomac River. It formed the perfect backdrop for great monuments celebrating history and culture. At age eight, I would take the bus west past the White House on Pennsylvania Avenue and turn onto 17th Street to the Corcoran Gallery of Art where I went to the Saturday's children art classes. I was in awe of what revered American architect Frank Lloyd Wright called the greatest example of Beaux-Arts architecture in the United States. Who could have imagined that decades later, I was hired as the museum's first director of public relations and special events. I got to create receptions for visiting dignitaries and hold press pre previews for exhibitions set in the impressive 40 foot tall atrium with its Doric colonnade. It was during a staff meeting at the museum when the conservator who moonlighted as a travel agent said to me, a person on his charter had just canceled a trip and asked, did I want a round trip ticket to Paris? All I had to do is pay the taxes. Well, needless to say, that was a yes. And I immediately made my, first, uh, my plans for my first trip to France. That same week, an artist at an exhibition opening, I was uh, heard that I was planning to go to Paris. He knew that Oscar Wilde was my literary hero and told me that his ancestor, Sir Jacob Epstein, sculpted the monument marking Wilde's burial place in Père Lachaise Cemetery. I had my first destination. And this is where our story begins. On my first visit in 1981, I became enthralled with the cemetery's rich history and artistic significance. I vowed to return as soon as I could, so in 1982, I commissioned a colleague, British photographer Joe Cornish, to join me and create what I envisioned to be a nostalgic photo album of this Elysium of the afterlife. Three decades later, we are still captivated by the ever-changing beauty and mystery of Père Lachaise. When I told Joe that we had a book deal, he quipped, I had hoped we might publish our work about Père Lachaise before we were buried there, Carolyn. I discovered that Joe and I were not the only ones in love with the cemetery. It is known as the most famous resting place in the world and welcomes 3.5 million visitors each year. It's the fourth most popular site in Paris after Notre Dame, the Eiffel Tower, and the Arc de Triomphe. However, it's been closed due to the pandemic, only briefly allowed funerals. However, I understand from a friend of mine who was a tour guide, they are opening it up to limited number groups. And as I understand from Charles, and we were discussing that we think that with the right vaccinations, Americans will be welcome back in May. So I'm checking out my flights. <laughs> so what was the genesis for this cemetery in the first place? Over the centuries, war and the devastation of the plague had already filled the catacombs and church graveyards across Paris, the traditional burial places. There was an incident when a heavy rain caused a major flood and a shared wall of the Cemetery of Innocence and an adjacent apartment building collapsed, spilling thousands of corpses into the homes of the unsuspecting apartment dwellers. 18th century Parisian engineers had overlooked one significant question in their urban design scheme, what to do with the ever increasing population of the dead. Those apartment residents and many other citizens complained to the young new first consul, Napoleon Bonaparte. So Napoleon, Napoleon directed the engineers to solve the problem. Nicolas Frochot, prefect of the Seine, proposed holding a competition to create new cemeteries on the outskirts of the city. The first ever commission of its kind was awarded to architect, landscape, and urban designer, Alexander Theodore Brogniard. 
However, people were not thrilled about the long trek to the countryside for burials or visitation. Plus, the bishops did not like the idea of losing money, but the church had no choice. They had run out of room. For show had a keen sense of how to appeal to the masses by creating something intriguing. He convinced Napoleon of a plan to win over all the critics, as well as the hesitant clientele, by naming the cemetery after Father Lachaise, the Jesuit confessor of the popular Sun King, Louis XIV. He launched an inventive real estate promotion, filling the cemetery with sculptures and the remains of the famous and infamous, including Moliere and La Fontaine, and the ill-fated 12th century lovers, Heloise and Abelard. The grand opening of the cemetery was held on May 21st, 1804. You have the 19th century um, architects to thank for moving away from the Christian dominated imagery of a cemetery as macabre sadness and a frightful place filled with dead bodies to the pantheistic view of a cemetery that reflects a more peaceful concept of a sweet rest. After all, the earliest interpretation of the word cemetière was a place where one sleeps. Etienne Louis Boulet, one of the most admired architects of the period, and the mentor of Brogniard was a proponent of the pre-romantic celebration of the divinity in nature. Brogniard carried out this concept in his revolutionary garden style cemetery that has stood as a model for uh, graveyards in the US and Europe, including Highgate Cemetery in London and Rock, Hill, uh, Rock Creek and Oak Hill cemeteries in Washington, DC. Let's look at the map to get our bearings as we walk through the cemetery. Remember this layout as we start at the very bottom, you'll see the dark arrow at the bottom there, um, and we'll work our way up. The three tours in my book are designated by the color shading. The area to the right um, in tour one denotes the oldest section that was founded in 1804. Etienne Goethe served as the chief architect of the city of Paris in the 1800s, known for his classic designs, he designed the main Boulevard de Ménilmontant entrance to Père Lachaise, which consists of an elongated horseshoe-shaped entryway with a pair of tall central gates topped by two carved medallions. These bear, bear the classic funerary symbols of the torch representing life's flame and the winged hourglass symbolizing the passing of time. As you enter these massive gates and walk up the main aisle, Avenue Principal, passing the graves of writer Colette and Louis Visconti, an architect who worked on the Louvre under Napoleon III, one encounters the monumental sculptor, sculpture Omor, To the Dead, created by artist Albert Bartholome, originally designed as a tribute to his wife. The monument features a mournful procession of 20 men, women, and children marching toward an immense dark doorway into the afterlife. The site also serves as an ossuary that contains the remains of many thousands of Parisians. When other cemeteries in the city were closed or when people's graves in Père Lachaise were reclaimed due to negligent or lack of rent payment, the remains were placed in the ossuary. You'll see the two doors on either side of the sculpture or the entrances. French architect Hector Guimard designed the only completely Art Nouveau tombs in the cemetery. His atelier signature appears in the lower right corner near the back of the dove gray marble tomb. Guimard was strongly influenced by Eugene Violet Le Duc's ideas about ornamental structures. Guimard is best known for his entrances to the metro stations throughout Paris including the Père Lachaise Metro Station, which has distinctive lettering, art signage, and curvaceous metalwork on the railings. One of my favorite areas of the cemetery has a significant landscape history before Brogniard applied his design scheme. The original 16-acre site was the Jesuit retreat, as I mentioned, of Father Lachaise, previously called Mont-Louis. Yes, there are mountains in Paris. Others are Montmartre and Montparnasse. Mont-Louis, a, has a thousand foot elevation, creates some steep walks when you visit. The bucolic site was planted with lemon groves, rose gardens, tree arbors, 
and many winding paths ideally suited to the contemplative life of its former inhabitants. It is now called the cemetery's romantic section, which was the original area founded in 1804 and now serves as the resting place for luminaries such as composers Bellini and Cherubini and Frederick Chopin. This particular image is Joe Cornish's uh, shot taken at dusk on All Souls Day one year. We have yet to be able to duplicate this wonder at that particular time of the season and in, in the evening. Grosjean died in 1813, so many of his grand schemes never made it off the drawing board, including his dream of a monumental pyramid as the focal point in the cemetery. Historians have been fascinated with Egyptian civilization since antiquity. In France, this obsession was highlighted by Napoleon's campaign in Egypt. Obelisks and pyramids, which appeared on buildings all over Europe, became a prominent feature throughout Père Lachaise. Today is a charming mix of structures with elegantly styled crypts next to oversized mansions of the dead encircled by rows and rows of modest headstones, creating the effect what I feel is an enchanted architectural theme park. The architectural designs in Père Lachaise represent an encyclopedic grouping of many periods. You would have to zigzag to every corner of Paris to find such a comprehensive collection of the city's important sculpture and architecture, reflecting many periods and styles of art and design from early Roman times to the present. Fortunately, the tombs in Père Lachaise parallel the city's artistic growth and houses all these styles. Rochniard's original plan was complemented over the ensuing decades by hundreds of individual tombs created by an impressive roster of designers, sculptors, and architects, many of whom were created, credited with creating the significant urban plan and public structures throughout Paris. Some of those individuals are interred within the cemetery. Charles Percier, along with his architectural associate, Pierre Fontaine, are interred together in the far eastern part of the Romantic section. Their site, marked by a tall stell topped with an urn, with the symbols of the masons incised in a stone panel at its base. They were largely responsible for the popularity of the Empire style of the era. One of the numerous projects Napoleon hired them to design was the grandly arcaded stretch of housing on Rue de Brutale, the second longest street in Paris opposite the Louvre. Considered one of the first theorists of modern architecture, Villette Le Duc was a noted scholar, restorer of medieval buildings, central figure in the revival of Gothic architecture, and the author of a 10 volume history of French, French architecture. He won the commission with a colleague to restore the Cathedral of Notre Dame. Upon, upon completing the Notre Dame project, Villette Le Duc became chief of the Bureau of Historic Monuments. That same government office now oversees the city's preservation of cemeteries. He also took commissions for various tombs and monuments including the ornate mausoleum of the Duc de Mornay in Père Lachaise. Evidence of the architect's vast knowledge of design is displayed in this elaborate creation, a tribute to the language of stone and form through its many layered finials. It may appear to some to be more like an aging wedding cake. Built in 1894 and designed by Jean Camille Formiger, the name columbarium comes from columba or Latin for dove and originally referred to compartmentalized housing for doves and pigeons. On some days, a plume of smoke spirals up from the chimney, signaling the operation of its crematorium. To have one's ashes placed in the columbarium, one can choose an underground vault or a niche for small urns in the two-tiered loggia outdoors. To access burial niches on the upper tier, one uses the stairs. Several cultural icons rest here, including dancer Isadora Duncan and writer Richard Wright. Patrons often paired architects with sculptors when commissioning a tomb. Artist David Donger produced some 56 sculptures throughout Père Lachaise. These include the equestrian monument to General Jacques Nicolas Gobert and the bronze bust of the novelist Honoré de Balzac. Sculptor Antoine Atex has numerous examples of his work throughout Paris, including Père Lachaise. 
He was commissioned to create the rectangular panel sculptures of peace and resistance on top of either side of the east facade of the Arc de Triomphe. These and other high profile commissions established his stellar reputation. However, his most famous work is the tomb he designed for fellow artist Theodore Jericho. With bas reliefs of the painter's artworks, including the raft of the museum that you see on the front, on its base. The actual painting is on view in the Louvre. So when visiting the cemetery, do make sure to follow all the way around every sculpture so that you don't miss any details. And you will find the signature of Etoine Atex under the bronze pillow where Jericho's left arm rests. Atex also designed the family tomb of Francois Vincent Raspai, who was jailed for his participation in the 1848 revolution. Atex depicts sorrow via the poignant artwork titled Madame Raspai's Farewell to the Jailed Revolutionary. The ghost of Madame Raspai stretches her arm out from beneath her shroud toward a barred window. Leon von Doyer was one of the romantic Beaux-Arts architects of the 19th century, and he won the competition with sculptor Danger to design the tomb of Napoleon's general, Maximilian Sebastian Foy. It's an elegant Greek Doric monument with Foy's figure in the center. Valdoyer was part of the group known in Paris as a company of romantic radicals. Their projects often elicited the disapproval of the conservative Beaux-Arts academics. Controversy followed artists as well as architects and the American born sculptor Sir Jacob Epstein caused a stir with his monument to Oscar Wilde. He carved the tomb from a 20 ton monolith extracted from an English quarry. It presented an enormous challenge to the artist who spent nine months carving the large stone on site without referring to preliminary smaller models. A nude winged sphinx, the crown on the figure's head and the hairstyle are reminiscent of the winged Assyrian bulls in the British Museum, which date, date back to 710 to 705 BC. The wild sculpture was one of Epstein's earliest commissions made possible through the patronage of Helen Carew, a member of Wild Circle. The work received high praise following the press preview, but due to its prominent male parts was condemned as indecent. The sculpture was wild, um, excuse me, Epstein's work on the Strand in London was also criticized to the highly sensual modeling of the nude figures. The sculpture on Wilde's tomb was at one point covered with a tarp by the French police. It was, let, it was the last scandal attributed to the revered writer. Many pilgrims coming to the cemetery are bearing mementos to leave at the grave sites. Flowers, photos, a personal item, letters, even the occasional marijuana joint left at the grave of Jim Morrison of the doors. And small pebbles, a Jewish tradition, signifies having visited a loved one as seen on the grave of Gertrude Stein. Her life partner is right behind her, Alice B. Toklas. Beside the tombs of writers, as such as Sade Hadayet, a new tradition has recently sprung up. As you can see, a small jar filled with pens and pencils to the bottom left serves both as a symbol for the scribe interred, as well as I suspect uh, a handy implement should one want to jot down a thought to leave behind. My own desire to speak directly with the departed is what inspired me to create what is the heart of the book called The Conversations. I chose eight cultural icons and asked about their triumphs and failures, as well as any wisdom they wanted to share with those above ground. The eternal staying power and drama of funerary monuments appealed to the artists who contributed to the mesmerizing environment of Pere Lachaise. Their use of funerary symbols such as draped urns, hourglasses, bats, skulls, and mourning figures not only echoed the styling of societal tastes, but also delivered on the promise of visceral awe and wonder in the land of the dead. Bats on tombs illustrated the eerie side of eternity Skeletons and skulls or other death symbols remind the viewer that death is a part of life and unavoidable. Winged figures slowly replace the death's head or soul effigy. These figures are generally considered angels. The word angel comes from the Greek word angelos, which means messenger. 
The chief duty of the angel was to carry messages from God. Statues of women in the 18th century often represented the seven virtues, prudence, justice, temperance, fortitude, faith, hope, and charity. Powerful examples how women are seen to embody some of the deepest qualities of the human condition. In Père Lachaise, there are a few scantily clad female figures. Sometimes family members unaware of the sculptural commission must have been alarmed to arrive at a gravesite and discover a half-naked damsel in, a in an apparent erotic rapture rather than in deep mourning. So at Père Lachaise, we are confronted with the great paradox of this great vast burial ground, which embraces serenity, horror, anguish, and acceptance, the grand sweep of the human experience. Day after day, year after year, the city of immortals waits its next visitors. Thank you. This is this is great. Thank you very much, Caroline. You know, great great photo tour. Uh, we, we all we all like photo tours, and especially if places like that in Paris, which I'm sure many people on this on this uh, conference have either visited before or want to visit. So it's pretty pretty nice. So uh, again, uh, if you want to see more of these pictures, they are available in this in the in. Carolyn's book right here, City of Immortals, um, which uh, if you order by May 31st, you'll see there's a, there's a link in the chat feature. If you use the promo code Lachaise, uh, you get a 20% discount and there's a little signature, uh, a little signature pad. So it'll be, uh, uh, you'll have it signed by Carolyn Campbell. So there is that little perk. And then the additional perk is uh, there's your own personal copy of the map of the cemetery. So next time you want to locate where your where where the tomb of whoever it is you want to check out is, it's a handy handy little map there. So that's really cool, Carolyn, for you know, having included this. So um, we did have a few a few questions that came in while you were talking, which is good. Uh, Barbara Young from my own chapter here at DuPage County um, asks if uh, some of the famous people buried in Père Lachaise were originally buried elsewhere and moved. Excellent question. Um, I've become a little familiar with the people who have exited Père Lachaise. <laughs> uh, Maria Kappen, ashes were stolen one year out of the columbarium. They were recovered and returned, and they were stolen again. At that point, the family decided to return her ashes to Greece, and they were spread in the Aegean Sea. Uh, Chopin's heart is in Warsaw, but his body is in Père Lachaise. I don't know that anyone, I, mean, I believe that um, Rossini is no longer buried there. Um, I am not familiar with the reverse of people that have my on other places, but um, I have to research that. I'm, I'm always encouraged for finding out new facts, so I'll look at it. it. It's a con constant work in progress, yeah, I get it. Um, Michael Fanning uh, comment, uh, mentions that the graveyard is bordered by Médine Montan, which is where the famous Oscar-winning film uh, The Red Balloon was filmed, so ah. there you go. Um, Phyllis Perkins, also from my chapter, asks, uh, why is Oscar Wilde's tomb encircled with glass? Well, this um, occurred in the, I think, early 90s. Um, there, graffiti, fortunately, has plagued the cemetery. It's it being 107 acres, it's very difficult for the police um, to really um, look out for its welfare. And people um, started uh, kissing the tomb which a lot of people thought, what a wonderful symbol of affectation, but um, affection rather, but the, a little did they know that the oil in the lipstick was seeping into the porous limestone and every time they went to clean it, it would lose a layer of detail. So after several years and a lot of consternation, the governments of Ireland and France got together and did a fundraiser and decided to put a plexiglass shield around the tomb, which does protect it, 
However, now people are kissing the plexiglass, <laughs> which is much safer. And I myself threw a couple of roses over the barrier um, to make my own personal tribute. But it is it that that is the reason it's, it's to protect it. Um, again, it's um, he was moved from Ban Lo Cemetery initially into Père Lachaise, and it's quite a remarkable sculpture. And I'm glad that they're preserved. Cool, and uh, yeah, it's much easier to use Windex on plexiglass. No, mine still. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, big, uh, big question. Um, how much of, from Ron Magnuson? How much of Père Lachaise is accessible to wheelchairs? Unfortunately, I think very little. Um, it's a cobblestones from the 19th century. Um, again, I suspect people who are in wheelchairs have to navigate Paris as it is. Mm -hmm. I don't know that they restrict anyone who has disabilities, but um, it is fairly difficult because all of the pathways are cobblestones. And when you get into, you can see um, here in this um, image behind me, again, it's somewhat flat and the cobblestones are close, but in, to get into some areas like where Chopin is buried, it's off a beaten path and you're literally navigating little hillsides and strewn little gullies and things like that so but again, you can enjoy the some of the really significant areas um, so I would say depending upon how adventurous you are <laughs> yeah <in> wheelchair <laughs> because uh, yeah and I and I remember speaking to you ahead of this uh, ahead of this conversation this presentation you did mention that because of Pelache's location on a hillside, uh, you'd better come, you know, with good, uh, good walking shoes, comfortable walking shoes, uh, traipse up and down the, the various paths of the cemetery, correct? Yeah. 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 I, I visit the gym for several weeks before I make a trip every year. I mean, it is, it's a hiking tour. I mean, the tours <laughs> in, the, uh, in the book, I designate which are more rigorous. Tour two is, you know, you're walk, it's a, a thousand foot. It's quite steep. Um, Sue Burke, to know if you if you have any information on who the first person buried at the Père Lachaise was. Do you know that? I have a very good friend, Marie Belém, who is my go-to historian. And it's not anyone very famous. I know where they're buried. They're in the 74th division. Unfortunately, I don't recall their name at the time, but it took a while for the place to catch on. It was really about 10 years before the families started to compete to create big mausoleums. Napoleon wanted it to be a cemetery for all Parisians. Um, so anyone could be buried there as long as they could afford the plot. So, um, but I, another little note here, I'll, I will find out the first one. There is, um, there is always, uh, always a lot that you can, uh, that you can research, right? Um, there is a question, a comment from Michael Fanning about uh, someone who I know is uh, featured in your, in your book um, called Léon Thierry, um, yes. who is um, a, for, a former um, a race car driver of his day, which is right here, yes. this picture right here. Um, so he won the Gordon Bennett Cup in 1904-1905 and also worked for Michelin and apparently uh, rumored to be the inspiration for the Michelin Man. So, quite, but, these, the particular tombs that kind of commemorate a person's passion are a wonderful and and that Pierre one was I mean literally there is the car's radiator behind him as a headstone and he's driving the steering wheel and he's got his goggles and his ear leather cap it's it's extraordinary it's wonderful and uh, uh so and uh Gérard Errant is, uh, is saying if you can comment on the wall again against which those communards were killed I guess there is the the wall you know outside the cemetery right where right the, the the original wall is outside but inside the cemetery near the 97th division they put a plaque to commemorate it um and again um, this is where 170 of the communards were shot in place. I mean, a little a battle went on in the cemetery among the tombstones. And, um, it's close to where the Holocaust uh, memorials are in the far, far eastern section of the cemetery. And um, so, yeah, pretty uh, poignant place, of course. 
Um, so uh, Sue Burke, you, you, you mentioned that you looked all over the place for the resting places of uh, Piaf and Yves Montand, but she couldn't find them, even though she consulted the guide at the, uh, at the entrance. And uh, that's, where, that's where Carolyn's map is really <laughs> handy because you have the, the, the listing of all the famous uh, people there, including Edith Piaf, as you might see on the, the part I'm holding up. So, um, so that that is right, Carolyn. Uh, you know, as far as uh, the maps that they distribute at the at the cemetery the, itself, they're very basic. Very. Um, it was. I was very excited. I thought how generous of the city to provide a map, but it's a small little Xeroxed paper, and it includes. I include eighty four cultural icons on my map and specifically musicians, artists and writers and so forth. But they had one that was like 300 people and I got very excited. And then I realized that little dot in the center that they would designate was, you had no description of the tomb and it was like 60 tombs in that area. So again, quite a treasure hunt. Um, that's what really kind of motivated me to create the map because I would come back and I would did a lot of drawings and sketches and people, when they would go to Paris, I would give them my drafts of the map. And I said, tell me if you find anything. And there's a lot of people when you're in the cemetery, everybody's an adventurer, everyone. I would swap, I'm looking for Piaf. And they would say, I'm looking for Bellini. And so we would you know, look at each other's maps. Um, but again, I think you need to be very strategic when you visit. If you want to find someone, do as much advance research as possible because again, I personally find it's half the fun is getting lost because you discover all new amazing places. And I never saw Oscar Wilde the first year. I never got there <laughs> because he was at the far end of the cemetery. I don't think I left the romantic section that first year. It was just a you know, phenomenal sculptures and different architecture. So again, I, I did design a GPS app which came last year and it's coming and it just came out in French. So um, it's on my website, cityofimmortals.com. So if you, I've, I've used both the map and the GPS tour because sometimes the satellite feed, there's trees overhead. You need all the help you can because it's, exactly. yeah. it's very dense. And again, um, but it's all worth it. It's just such a beautiful environment. You know? Exactly. And uh, yeah, and as you mentioned, half the fun is just, you know, getting, you know, exploring, going browsing and stuff. That's pretty, pretty nice. Um, so, and Peterson, also from my DuPage chapter, uh, uh, says, okay, you mentioned Jim Morrison, Richard Wright, there's a uh, Gertrude Stein. Are there any other, uh, any other noteworthy Americans uh, buried in the, in the cemetery that you know of? Um, not a lot. I think that, um, I'm, I'm trying to looking at my list right here. Um, yeah, even Max Ernst, some of the well-known artists are again European. So, um, uh, so, uh, so a pretty limited crowd then, huh? Yes, again, it, it, uh, during that period, again, a lot of other uh, artists were buried in Montmartre to Montparnasse. So, okay. Um, again, those were probably the three most highly visible names that I saw. And, um, but again, I stopped at 84. I could have gone on and on and on and on. Oh, yeah. I mean, I just tapped into the French uh, cultural icons that are buried there. I could have gone on for hundreds more, but again, my publisher yeah. said so many yeah. pages. <laughs> the, your, your, your publisher was like, we'll do a sequel for the next edition. Um, uh, two people, Nancy Strom and Kathleen Campbell, commented about uh, Eloise and Abelard saying they were moved to the Belle Lachaise, right? You know, they were not yes. interred there, right? Yeah. This so. was all part of Frechot's publicity campaign. He was collecting famous bones to draw and, and help the marketing effort. So, yeah, they were in um, their remains. The same with Moliere and La Fontaine. You know, their ashes were in other locations. So, mm -hmm. cool. a, a negotiator. And um, Rosemary Havner uh, asks how often the gift items are removed from the crypts, from the, from the grave sites. Well, I think that the responsibility for maintaining the tombs are up to the families. 
So um, flowers and, and so forth. I do believe that some of the highly visited places um, like Chopin's too, the Chopin Society, um, and there's also a society for Colette, they regularly come and clean the tomb, change the flowers and so forth. I think Jim Morrison's probably the family again lives in the United States. So I suspect that the, um, the groundskeepers have to keep that cleared out because between the bottles of Jim Beam whiskey and the joints that get left behind, even though it has the police barricades around it, um, there's still quite a bit of memorabilia that is left behind, letters and album covers. So I think cemetery officials themselves maintain that one. They maintain that. Um, Sue, also, Sue Burke also comments about the resting place of Jim Haynes, an American who passed recently and who hosted uh, wonderful expat dinners in Paris and wondering if you've seen uh, his, his resting place. No, I have not but thank you for that. I pretty much kind of, um, Marcel Marceau was buried there. I, I mean, thinking I haven't done many recent burials, um, partially out of respect for people, families where they just recently passed away and so forth. So I looked at more historic figures, but no, I have not seen. And, and a lot of the maps are, um, there's one other map that is handed out at um, one of the gates and it's only updated every, maybe every five years. So okay. some of the newly, but I, I will make a note, Jim Haynes, I will. I'll yeah. Uh, and um, Lynn, a good, good question from Lynn Frank. Is there room for new burials and what criteria are used to decide who can be buried in the, who, in the, in the Palais Chaise? Um, well, the primary one is that you either may, must be born or died in Paris. So the reason Jim Morrison qualified is because he died there. Um, this will be the 50th anniversary of his death, as a matter of fact, July 2nd. Um, if your family has a crypt already in the cemetery and there is space available, you can be buried there. However, if you desire to be buried there and you don't have any of those other criteria, there is a waiting list. There's around 300 um, on that waiting list. And hmm happens is they become available, you can imagine the cemetery is over 200 years old, some families have not maintained the tombs, and they usually give the um, families about two to three years to either repair the tombs or address any problems, and if they don't, they disinter the person, put their remains in the ossuary, and they make the, um, the plot available to the next candidate or whatever so mm -hmm. but you can but there is a waiting list if you don't qualify under the you know being born or died in Paris mm -hmm. and uh Christine comments that you know uh, there's a yeah with the ossuary there must be a lot of persons moved into that ossuary right there's, there's millions of remains in the ossuary yes <laughs> yeah well and um um, in terms of, I guess, the plot, I think they, I think they do charge for, for a concession. They, I think they call it a concession in French, uh, yes. the, the, the plot, the, basically the lease of the plots for, for like a better Right. Well, uh, you can purchase one in perpetuité, um, mm -hmm. expensive. They're probably about 15,000 euros, but mm -hmm. I believe, again, oddly enough, um, I would have thought being on a main avenue like this would have been more prestigious. They, the farther and deeper and more private the areas, the more expensive because yeah. it and gives privacy and so forth. But I think sure. start at about 2,000 euros. Mm -hmm. And again, you can also get a niche in the columbarium, which is um, less expensive, of course. Hmm. Cool. Well, and uh, yes, Stephen Young from Connecticut is the one who asked uh, how much the plot costs. So, any royalty buried in the Père Lachaise, Kathleen's asking, um, any royalty? No. Well, there is Anna de, uh, de Noël, who was a Romanian poet. Her, her family members, there is a baron though, um, buried there. Um, I don't believe any members of Napoleon's family are buried there. There are certainly a lot of um, prestigious government officials. There are some presidents there. There are Napoleon's generals, but I don't know of any specific French royalty. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, uh, most of those may be buried or sort of very least in the in the Basilica Abbey of Saint Denis, which is just uh, just north of uh, just north of Paris, I believe. But uh, um, Karen Carges researched uh, did a bit of research, I guess, and said that the first bur person buried there was actually a five year old girl called Adelaide Payard de Villeneuve. Uh, so. Um, that's kind of, that's, that's, uh, well, that's, thank you for that. <laughs> there you go, Karen. Thanks so much for providing that. Um, and by the way, folks, keep the questions and comments, uh, coming. And if you have any personal anecdotes, you know, maybe you've been to the Palaches and you have an anecdote that you want to share, uh, we'd strongly be interested in, uh, in finding, uh, finding what you have to say also. Um, Claire Harrison asks if there are any unusual or interesting, especially interesting quotes on gravestones that especially stood out. You know, anything that's um, memorable? It is, um, yes, um, in uh, the, the back of uh, Oscar Wilde's tomb is a quote from um, De Profundis, which was the book that he wrote in prison. And let me see if I can even find that quickly. That is, let's see here. There's some. Um, um, of course, now that I put the, did I put it on here? I think I've got it in the conversation. I know that there is a wonderful one of a man looking into his wife's um, face. There's a mask. And mm -hmm. um, again, I have put these to memory. I'm seeing if I can just kind of locate them. But they, yes, there are uh, few. Their writers will put a quotation from their books. And let me see if I can find the Oscar Wilde. And um, apparently yes, and, and the Oscar Wilde quote on the back, and alien tears will fill for him pity's long broken urn, for his mourners will be outcast men and outcasts always more. Lovely. Nice, nice. And um, um, and then Michael Michael Fanning asks, uh, mentions that George Whitman, who is the successor owner of uh, Shakespeare and Company bookstore, is buried in the Palace. So he's wondering if he has any special monuments. I don't know how recently it was that he uh, uh, that he was uh, buried there, but. If there is a special. My, my book is sold at Shakespeare and Company, but I, when I get back to Paris, I will definitely ask. Um, I, again, I haven't been back since uh, December of 2019. So um, that was the last time I was there. So um, I don't know um, about his burial. And um, yes, um, is, is Isadora Duncan was also an American, wasn't she? Oh, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah, we Kathleen are from, and, um, from Northern California. Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the the criteria, I guess, and Christine's asking about you know the the Americans could be buried there because I guess they were residents of Paris. That, that's yes. Their their passing, right? So they that got them the right to be buried there, I suppose. Yeah. Yes. There's a few like Piaf did not die in Paris. But um, she, and the, and the same with Isadora Duncan, because Isadora Duncan was living in the south of France. But again, the prestige of the individual, and I'm sure the government found it, you know, a, appropriate to accommodate them. So who, it's all who you know. <laughs> exactly. Um, so Kirk ha asks a question, bigger, which is a good, good one in the sense that it came up when, uh, when, when there was the whole... Uh, Notre Dame uh, disaster there where it was said, okay, who's going to be able to, you know, redo the whole roof structure and stuff. And uh, are there many artisans right now who can repair the tombs? Like if one of the tombs in the backdrop behind you uh, were to fall into disrepair, there are artisans who could fix them up, you know? As a matter of fact, um, I follow quite a few Facebook pages of cemetery lovers and it turns out that the great granddaughter of Georges Méliès, the wonderful filmmaker who invented all of the early, you know, split screen and all of the wonderful techniques, uh, they wanted to restore his bronze bust as well as some of the and underneath. It's quite a, a laborious process. You have to get approval of the cemetery, the Historic Monuments Association. There are a list of restorers that are approved. 
they are quite costly because um, it's done very delicately um, to only restore the bronze and take the stain off of the stone for Melier's tomb was $40,000. So they did a fundraiser. I took care of the, uh, the cinema people in the United States. I volunteered to put the word out to the entertainment industry here in California. And they raised, not only did they raise the $40,000, but an additional $8,000 to keep maintaining it. Because again, the acid rain, nature, um, it's, it's, there's, it's impossible for them. I think there's probably about 30 or 40 tombs that the city of Paris have designated historic significance and they maintain them. But families and so forth, um, there's some really beautiful monuments. Oh, more which was the early one that we showed with the group of the adult. Early on, that was covered with um, mold and lichen and green and acid rain. And now it's a beautifully washed white marble. So some are disappointing. Yeah. I mean, it's the time yeah. is taking its toll. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, I get uh, Claire also mentioned Claire Price makes a comment about another another cemetery in Paris. I know we've talked about uh, Montmartre and then Montparnasse, but there's another one, and I and I happen to like that name. It's a cool place name in Paris. It's Picpus. There's a cemetery in Picpus uh, near near the Place de la Nation. And I think yeah, there's a there's a big mass grave or ossuary of sorts there. Um, so. Um, um now uh karen tillman thank you for coming karen uh, my friend at the f2 page uh asks if you have a time of year to photograph in the cemetery well ideally because of the um the lack of foliage on the trees that's the image behind me you can see more of the tombs in the fall and winter and also you have the start wonderful contrast of the orange and, and yellow foliage in the fall. But you also have the advantage because the closing time and dusk, early in the morning and at dusk for me as a photographer are the ideal times to take images. Um, unfortunately, in the springtime, the, the cemetery closes at about 5.30 or 6 and sunset isn't until 8 o'clock. So springtime, you don't get that golden hour. So I always highly recommend, particularly at All Souls Day, which is November 2nd, when all the tombs, which are normally maybe kind of unkempt and um, uh, families come polish the tombs, being beautiful garlands of flowers. So it's, it's breathtaking. So I always recommend coming right before All Souls Day and on All Souls Day to capture that variance. But again, this, I, for in May of 2019, I went for the first time in the spring and I experienced what was like a snowfall of chestnut blossoms, these fragrant pink and white chestnut blossoms that covered me and all of the tombs. It was like being blanketed in nature. So there's something to be said about in spring, but I would mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, and speaking of photography, I know there's a there's a picture in uh, in Carolyn's book uh, when you when you get a chance to order it and get it and read it through it at home. There is also a very good parts so when you're in the winter, in the Palaches when all the trees have lost their foliage, is you can actually get a very good shot of the Eiffel Tower between the trees there. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, and I designate I describe that it's right at the top. Mm -hmm one of the uh very near one of the major chapels yeah and, this and um any any place for any new tombs linda simmons is wondering well it's interesting um they're they're repurposing some of the old chapel style tombs um you'll see the one just off of my left shoulder um where they've instead of just holding maybe one or two bodies that are buried underneath they're repurposing them and redesigning them and creating niches like the columbarium so that you can have the remains, the cremation remains, like maybe 15 or 20 people put in one of those chapels. So that's a new approach that's coming up. And there are some very contemporary um, treatments that are being done. Uh, a lot of artists put sculptures on top of their tombs. So I, I do believe that you have to get approval there again, it's a, um, a city-run um, cemetery, but there's a lot of bureaucracy in approvals. 
<laughs> so you really have to get to go through a couple of, you know, loops um, of approval. Uh, the, the proverbial red tape, right, exists everywhere. Oh, yes. <laughs> and uh, yeah, a few a few comments are coming in about you know people's memories and experiences ranging from not being able to find most of the graves that you intended to visit, which you know, um, or you know, Connor comments on that, um, doo -doo -doo -doo, so, and drawing um, hunting for specific stones, etc. Um, oh, Lynn comments that she read that the cemetery officials weren't going to accept Jim Morrison until his friends told them that he was a writer. Which <laughs> I was very fortunate um, that I, when I was started this book, I was living in Washington and I wanted to interview Ray Manzarek, the keyboard player of the doors. And I, he was very accessible. So I interviewed him. And when I moved to Los Angeles, a friend of mine, the woman who sold me my condo knew the first manager of the doors and I got to interview him and he was at the burial. So I got this wonderful exclusive interview with him. And um, I also met Alan Rone, who was a college friend of, of Morrison's who found the body, as a matter of fact. And it was Agnes Varda and Alan Rone that made the arrangements for the burial. They did not identify him as Jim Morrison. They named, they told the police that his name was Douglas Morrison. He was a, a writer, an American writer and an alcoholic and he had just died. So they didn't do an autopsy, they didn't question anything. So they did not, the officials did not find out it was Jim Morrison of the doors until the burial certificate was signed and he was already interred. They were afraid of all of the insanity that would have happened around the burial. They wanted it to be private. There was no headstone. It literally was, he was buried right there in the earth and, um, yeah, I detail that in conversation. It was fascinating to be able to, to speak with everyone who was still alive and knew all of the details. So, and um, and uh, they, 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 he didn't get taught. He, he, he's in perpetuity. So there were rumors that they were going to disinter him. And no, he's, he's, but he's there. Yeah. He's there to stay. Um, how, uh, we mentioned the arts and the, of course you know there is uh, another side of the arts the culinary arts and Helen asks if there are, uh, Helen Gray asks any famous chefs buried there or you know that you might know of for any you know personalities well I I haven't gotten to the chefs yet I'm working on the scientists Caltech here in, the, in LA has invited me to uh, speak with one of their science professors and we're going to uh, research some of the famous scientists and I'm going to do a conversation, but um, unfortunately, no, I don't know of any chefs right off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. Probably they could well be. So, uh, and um, Kirk is mentioning, uh, wow, I, I guess in, 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 a, in a response to the, the, the comment, the question about how many people would reconstruct the graves and maintain them, but He's, he says in August 2019, he was there, he saw a tomb with a QR code on it, and he used his phone to open the code, and it took him to a company specializing in crypt construction. So, so there you go, you know, and they're, and they're high tech, you know, they've got QR codes and stuff. Um, Anne Roloff, also from, our, from, from my chapter, says that she was a French teacher and took for her students to France in the spring. And she was like, there's always people, students who snuck out to see Jim Morrison's grave. And uh, at the time, you know, there were the concerns about, you know, safety and, uh, and, safety and, uh, and she was wondering, how is it now? I, mean, I know it's only open for a limited period of time during the day, so. Well, again, um, at, at the height of what was really an unfortunate situation with people putting graffiti, it was very difficult to find Jim Morrison's tomb because at, there, at that juncture there was a headstone. So people started drawing on all of the surrounding tombs, which is really desecrating other families, crypts and so forth with arrows, this is the way and so forth. So um, several times they cleaned all of the area tombs and the graffiti would come back. So they assigned police officers to stand by, they put, installed some cameras, and now they have this, you know, barricades, but it doesn't really inhibit people. It just kind of 
sets of respective boundary for people to just stay on this side of it and so forth. And as I was mentioning to Charles, that there's become some very strange, because since, since people can't any longer write on it, they want to make a statement in there. And so there is a nearby tree and people started putting gum wads on the tree trunk. I have never seen anything like this. So the next time I was there, the, the, the caretakers had wrapped the trunk of the tree with a bamboo kind of covering. So now people don't harm the trunk. They're sticking their gum wads directly on the bamboo covering. So mm -hmm. I don't know what the tradition is. They, they, they started to <laughs> putting the locks on the, um, on the police barricades and they wouldn't, they were falling over. So they, they, they cut that out and so forth. So, yeah. And, uh, and, and, uh, and, then, and then people leave metro tickets too. I guess that's uh, it's, uh, on some tombs, right? And I, and I don't know if there's a special significance. Maybe, you know, it's a journey or... Um... Well, there, you know, in the Jewish tradition, you know, you leave a stone, which is a kind of a message. I have been here. I have passed by. And sometimes people don't have those. So they, all the, the walnuts that have fallen and the, the nuts that have, chestnuts that have fallen out of the trees, people... I mean, Marcel Proust, I, it was covered in walnut, rather, in a metro tickets. And I thought, was this a symbol of, you know, good, happy travels in your next life? Or I think people just want to leave some kind of a symbol, you know, uh, again, right while pens are left by a lot of the writers, there's always a lot of personal notes. Oscar Wilde, in particular, always notes people have written to him and left at the, the gravesite. Oh. Well, um, I uh, think we're getting close to the end of the hour here, and I know, uh, uh, so just want to kind of, you know, wrap things up, and again, remind people that, uh, that the, uh, about the book purchase, and again, you know, you'll maybe want to, you'll be incentivized to purchase the book now that you've had this fantastic uh, presentation there, so uh, certainly appreciate all of you for, for signing on here, uh, making this part of your Thursday evening, and uh, Merci beaucoup to Carolyn for, for your oh. time here with us today. And um, thank you, everyone. Uh, and thank you to everyone who pitched in comments, questions. And, uh, and uh, yeah, we'll certainly forward them all to, to Carolyn as well uh, after, the, after the presentation. So, um, Merci. Charles. Thank you, Melissa, so Merci much. Beaucoup. So, Merci. Uh, yeah. Merci. I hope you all enjoy your evening and we'll uh, you. see you next time at a Federation event. And, Support your local alliances. Au revoir. Au revoir. Yes. Merci beaucoup.